What's up, guys? This is Mitch from BoardCo. I am joined by McKay here uh, with me um, as we're going to go through and record this episode today. And uh, we're going to cover a topic. Uh, McKay is our uh, finance manager, our F&I manager here at BoardCo, um, knows more about Tobo financing than probably anybody out there. And uh, so we're going to have a conversation today and talk a little bit about boat financing. Now, this is a topic we have a lot of questions about, and it's one of the most misunderstood topics um, because pe it, people think that they may know a lot about it or may, may be familiar with it, but there's a lot of nuances that are different between um, boat financing and between a, a lot of other different financing that people are much more familiar with, whether it be mortgages or auto financing or things of that nature. Um, and so we want to have a discussion and talk about that a little bit, talk about some of the differences. Uh, we did a video a while back. Um, it was one of the earlier videos that I shot um, years ago talking about boat financing. And it was one of the most popular videos we ever did. Well, that, that information is really outdated. A lot of things have changed. Um, and uh, that's what we wanted to discuss here today. Um, and I know a fair bit about this, but McKay is actually well, a lot more versed in this than I am. And so... I um, want to invite him on to talk about this and and talk about the current um, financing environment and and what we're what we're seeing and expecting right now. So, McKay, welcome. Um, Thank you. We uh, so first thing we wanted to talk talk about and I wanted to get your feedback and opinions on is uh, talk talk to us a little bit about what the differences are from a high level between both financing in particular Tobo financing that we deal with with whether it's Centurions and Supremes, or honestly, this is kind of the case, whether you're talking about boats like Malibu's, Mastercraft's, Nautiques, anything of that nature, um, versus other financing things that people may be more familiar with, like cars and uh, trucks and mortgages and things of that nature. Sure. So, strangely, it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a hybrid between the two, if you can kind of think of it that way. Some in some ways it's similar to an auto loan, in some ways it's similar to a mortgage, and a lot of that has to deal with expense. Um, if you're over a certain point, it's going to function a little bit closer to a mortgage. Like if your loan is over about in this environment about two hundred thousand dollars, then you have to do a lot of the same steps. Not quite as in depth, but you have to go through the proof of income process, you know, tax returns, personal financial statements. You'll have to you know do liquidity statements, that kind of stuff. Under that amount, it functions a lot more similar to like a car loan. Um, we apply with different lenders and kind of see, analyze your credit profile. And from there, uh, they just make a pretty basic decision um, based upon a very few key points to, you know, give us a rate and figure out exactly what you qualify for. All right. Well, so um, as far as that goes, um, as far as the qualification structure, those, those, that's really great um, information, breaking down those differences. Talk to us a little bit about some of the different term lengths and, and how how boat sure. loans are oftentimes structured. Like what's the most typical boat loans that, that you're processing and doing? What are the options that are available? And what, what are those different, what do the different loan structures look like when we're talking about Tobo? Sure. So, um in one way that it's similar to a mortgage, they function on typically pretty long terms. Um, I would say over 50% for sure, and probably closer to 70 or 80% of our financing clients, they do a 20 year term. Um, and if it's not a 20, it's almost certainly a 15. Um, and so that is quite a big difference from cars, but a lot of that is due to the expense and how they kind of hold their value. Um, banks, especially in marine and everything like that. They're a lot more comfortable um, with these longer term lengths because they just hold their value unlike cars do. Like you're not losing a substantial amount of value year after year after year after year. Um, as you've probably talked about in a lot of episodes, the boats, especially tow boats, hold their value extremely well. So they lend out on these long terms and... Basically, on the next time it gets sold, it's almost at the exact same price as they lend it out the first time. So um, so that is a bit different. Um, rates are a little bit higher than what you're going to see in auto. They're actually closer to a mortgage rate right now. Um, they're a little bit higher than mortgages, but not by a substantial margin. Um, and yeah, that's that's a, at least a little bit of a breakdown as, as far as the term lengths and everything is concerned. Um it helps you keep your payment low and, you know, use your boat year after year. And most of our guys are trading their boats in 
uh, three to five years. So um, that's pretty typical, and they keep that long term even though they're doing that. Yeah, it, that's something that's really interesting um, it, to note, and, and probably um, of uh, of every question we get. And I know that in a lot of these videos, I say, "Hey, this is a common question that we get," or something, or "This is a common question I hear." Um, I will say the number one question I get, bar none, like by a long shot compared to every other question I ever hear about towboats is how are people affording these things? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, and they're just going like, Hey, how, how are there this many boats that are sold that are 200,000 dollars plus? And, um, when you really look at it, the reason why it comes down to what McKay was just talking about, which is the loan structuring that is done on towboats. Now we have a lot of customers that, that, um, that do really well for themselves that, that um, pay cash or write a check or do something like that. It's not that dissimilar to, to what you see with, uh, with houses where you own one and then you end up trading up and progressively step your way up to some of the higher end boats. Um, but what ends up happening is we have a lot of people that, that they find out how affordable a boat is from a, um, from a payment standpoint and they go, oh, wow, I can, I can afford substantially more boat than I thought I could. And um, what, what it really comes down to, when you really look at it, you can talk about boats that are one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars, and uh, I mean, they're 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 they are expensive and they are a decent monthly investment, but it's not a monthly investment that is what a lot of people are thinking that it's like, hey, it's going to cost you, you know twenty thousand dollars a month or something like that. It, right. It, it's it, it's oftentimes in the thousand, twelve hundred, up to like fifteen hundred dollar a month range, which. It is, it is a decent amount of money, but it's not an amount of money that is is well outside the range of a, the vast majority of people that are out there. Right. Um, yeah. If you're if you're you know lower middle class, two hundred thousand dollar bro probably doesn't make any sense. But um, a lot of guys that are that make a decent income, they can afford these boats um, by doing it on that payment structure. And the interesting thing about it is, it's not like a auto loan where they're going to be way upside down. Um, in right. fact. To that point, uh, and this is something you can probably talk about. What would what percentage of people? Because um, you mentioned people are typically trading their boats in in the last three or in three to five years. Uh, the average a length of ownership for a towboat is uh, is actually about four years. Sure, um, that's industry wide. Um, what is the how how often do you see people that are upside down? Or what percentage of people are upside down in their loans that you're processing? Really, really, really low. The right this moment, there's a couple that have bought really new stuff like if you bought a boat at full-blown msrp in 2021 or 2022 from a dealer that was willing to get somebody upside down in a loan to do that then that's really the only guys that we're seeing um and even then i mean values are still high enough to where after their down payment and everything like that it's not like they're upside down 30 grand or something like that it's more that you know they they're Five thousand bucks or something like that that they're able to swing it if they're upgrading to something new. Um, but realistically, it, outside of that very strange scenario, nobody. I mean, most of our guys in the last five years that I've seen, they're either trading their boat to us for what they paid for it, or they're selling it on consignment for slightly more than what they initially paid. Yeah. Well, and, and there's some factors that exist with that. They're similar to like the auto industry. I mean, we saw used boat values skyrocket during the pandemic. Right. Um, but even pre-pandemic, this was not that unusual of a scenario. I mean, people oftentimes weren't selling their boats for what they paid for them new, but they were typically pay, selling them or trading them in for what they owed on the boat from a financing perspective. At least for what they owed. And, and so um, they're typically almost never upside down on the loans. And then um, at most states, you can turn, that, turn around and then apply that trade amount over towards a new boat and you get a sales tax credit. And so you're you're ending up saving a lot of money on taxes on the new boat and it ends up offsetting a lot of the new costs. And that's where I say similar to like what you have in a housing situation, people trading up. Um, it's a lot more feasible to trade up a boat than it is to, you know, jump straight into the highest end brand new one right out the gates. Right. Um, but it, it is something that is a, a lot more affordable. And the common thing that I reference and talk to people about is there's a lot of people that spend as much money on a, on cruises or on a trip to Disneyland once a year for their family as they'll spend owning one of the new high end surf boats. So it's not cheap. I, I mean, Disneyland's not cheap. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
but it's not a um it's it's not something that's well outside the normal range for people. It's just kind of what you decide you want to do. So I'm I'm personally in the camp of I'd much rather uh I'd much rather uh, get a boat and use it a lot and go to go to Lake Powell and spend a bunch of time that way and do that activity as a family than go to Disneyland. Um, a lot of times people do both. Um, and again, I, I personally would probably rather be poked in the eye with a stick than go to Disneyland. So, um, and some of you out there may be able to sympathize with me on that, but it's it, but it it is a more attainable thing than a lot of people expect. Sure, because a lot of people are expecting that it's going to be similar to a car that you're going to have, you know, a seven year car loan. Um, that's on one of these boats. Um, now, touching on a point that McKay mentioned is a boat, um, the rates on a boat are typically just set slightly above a mortgage rate. Sure. Um, right now, they're actually, um, we're, we're talking about this here in uh, June of 2023, um, it, which uh, the, the rates you're seeing on boats right now are sitting in the like mid seven Mid sevens seven. right now from, like if you're working with uh, national lenders, like you have a good dealer that is set up with a lot of lenders that, they're able to look through your credit profile and look at all three institutions and where you're going to pull the strongest and really get into it with the banks, then you're going to see rates in the mid sevens. If you go to your local credit union or something like that, it's going to look quite a bit worse. It'll probably be in the mid eights, maybe I was going to say we close to 9% or something like that from just somebody who doesn't write a whole lot of marine loans. The, they're, that's about where they'll be. But for somebody who does a lot, yeah, we're going to be into the mid sevens. Sometimes we're into the low sevens right now. Yeah, so. which to that point, um, it, that that is higher than what we've experienced over the last um, few years with interest rates rising. Depending on what time you guys are are watching this or listening to this, uh, it, your the interest rates may have changed. Um, they, they're always changing, um, but they're actually lower than we were expecting them to be about six to eight months ago. Sure, we were thinking that we were going to be in the nines um, right. right now. Um, though they've actually stayed relatively low. Um, right. they, they are higher than auto loans, um, mainly just because, especially on the new end side, um, a lot of auto loans, they subsidize the loans into the item. Uh, and that's because a lot of times the new auto manufacturers are the ones that are facilitating and providing the financing. So if you're going to go and buy, to, buy a new uh, you know, Ford F-350, you're if you're financing it, they built that financing rate into the purchase price of the vehicle, right. um, and uh, it, it's it's their way of trying to manage and handle capital that they can do. But um, they don't do that on the boat side because there's no such thing as you know centurion financing or nautique financing or something like that. There is the financing is is uh, done by typically larger financial institutions, um, and the reason for that is just there's nobody in the marine industry that's anywhere near the size of a like a Ford or a Toyota or something like that. In fact, the entire the entire towboat industry combined is not a is is not even a fraction of the size of Ford. Yeah. And so, um, so they 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 don't have their own specific financial institutions, but um, that they can subsidize with. But um, for for guys that are writing a check and paying cash, that's it, it's nice that you don't have a that you're not offsetting and subsidizing a lot of financing in that purchase sure. price. So. Um, so we talk about that with uh, the structure on the loans and things like that. What influences that structure? Like, why would somebody want to do a twenty-year term versus a fifteen-year term or a ten-year term? Because that, that's something that I know a lot of people look at and go, "Wow, twenty years! That's 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 basically a mortgage. That's way too far out. Who would finance a boat for twenty years? Why is that the one we do the most often?" There's a few reasons. Uh, flexibility is a big one for people. You can choose to pay more if you want to pay more. Um, that's a big one. It's typically not going to change your rate. Like if you're working with, again, big national lenders and everything like that, they're comfortable doing a 20-year term at the same rate that they'll do a 10, that they'll do a 7, at a 6. They're all the same across the board. The other reason uh, for at least guys that could pay cash, one of the reasons that they end up financing is cash flow. Um, you know, a $1,000 a month monthly payment for them they can do a lot with some extra cash on hand instead of financing, you know, they'll finance 150 grand. You know, we talk a lot about like just our highest end models at $200,000, 250, you know, that kind of thing. Realistically, if you're in a brand new entry level towboat, like an Axis, a Supreme, you know, anything like that, it, when you're closer to a hundred thousand bucks, I mean, you're even in the current lending environment, like I said, in the mid sevens, even when you're in the eights, like if you're even at eight and a half percent, 
realistically, you're under a thousand bucks a month as far as what you're going to pay monthly just on the financing side. Um, Which, if you look at it, the interesting thing about that is you're pretty darn close, actually, to the average auto payment that exists in the United States today. Yeah, what is it, like 700 bucks? Um, yeah, it's about that. Um, it's about $700 where you're talking about having a brand new surf boat that your monthly payment is within a couple hundred bucks a month of what most people's auto payments are. Right. Um, so that's that, That's where it just talks about the affordability aspect, and that is that is the answer to the que- the, the number one question people ask me, of how do people afford this? And the answer is, is it's not as unaffordable as some people expect or think. The initial investment for the average person is probably the most difficult part to attain. Because after you have the initial, you know, 10% down or that's what most lenders require. And typically you'll see great rates at that. So that initial 10% down payment, after you do that and you, like you mentioned, keep trading up boats, it ends up being a very small difference out of pocket as you roll things over from year to year. Um, you know, your monthly payment increase might go up because the boat gets more expensive as you crawl up, but you're not talking hundreds and hundreds of dollars in difference of monthly payment. You're talking the monthly payment ups a little bit, but you just roll that boat over, you get the tax credit and that kind of thing. And then it becomes a more self-sustaining hobby. And then you're only paying for the auxiliary things, the gas, the, you know, the boards, that kind of stuff. And you're able to continually roll into that boat. Which is the interesting part is a lot of people assume uh, depreciation schedules that are similar to like what you get on a car or um, even other things like an RV. Um, and boats are not in, are not necessarily that way. I mean, your your average depreciation on a new boat is hovering right about 10%. Um, I, we have a whole different video that I talk about this at length. Um, but they, they depreciate at a much slower rate uh, and they only depreciate a little more than that initially just because that has to depreciate enough year one to where somebody would buy that boat versus just buying a brand new one. If it depreciated 3%, who wouldn't spend 3% more and just get a brand new boat? Right. Um, unless those aren't available, which is what happened back in 2020. The new boats weren't available, so all of a sudden the used boats actually became worth them more than the new one, <laughs> um, which is similar to what happened in the auto industry, um, but to, to, to an even more significant extent in the boat industry to some degree. Um, but your average depreciation schedule is 10%, where in a car, your typical average depreciation is 30 to 35% year one. Right. And then a car will typically depreciate 10 to 15% every year after that. A boat is 10% year one, maybe up to 15 on the really high-end loaded malls. And then they typically will be 5% a year every year after that. And that goes almost forever. And then there's this really weird thing that happens with boats at about the 10 to 15-year mark. You actually see the level, the the value, if, as long as the boat's in decent condition, you see the value, the value level out to where it doesn't depreciate at all. And then over time, once you hit like year twenty or so, it actually starts to go up. up just it's weird. Like, yeah. um, where a car, I mean, you, you get a fifteen to twenty year old car, if it's used on a regular basis, it's not worth anything. Yeah, it's worth a couple hundred bucks. It, it, yeah, it becomes a it becomes a five hundred dollar car, and it's good to go. Where you know, I'm still seeing, uh, you know. Well, I'm seeing boats that are, you know, n- 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 towboats from the mid nineties, uh, that are for sale that are in the, that are, you know, twelve fifteen thousand $15,000, which people are like, Hey, that's not very much for a towboat. That boat was like $20,000 brand new. Yeah. Uh, it's, back it's in the nineties, exactly. uh, maybe, maybe less. And so it, the, you actually get to where people are buying boats. And after 20 years, the boat's worth about what you paid for it. Uh, now there's inflation and the value of money and things of that nature to factor in, but it's still a. It's not something you see with a car. You don't buy a twenty thousand dollar car, and that car is worth twenty thousand dollars in ten years. That's just not a thing. And a lot of it is that like there's a lot of misconceptions, and we've we've mentioned this in quite a few things. And it's a big thing at our dealership too is that like engine hours are not the same thing as like miles on the car and everything like that either. Like you know these engines after twenty years and everything, it's not like they've been run for. 500,000 miles in that time frame or anything because they're getting 40 hours a year of oh yeah I mean 60 hours a year of use at most you know people think uh, I mentioned this in in some other videos people uh, think that like let's say an engine hits a thousand hours and it's dead these engines are designed to run for three to four thousand hours just nobody ever puts so many hours on them right uh, virtually ever Uh, we have a couple customers that have boats that are uh, like mid 90s ski boats that are that have in the mid 2000 hours um, and as long as they're maintained and kept properly, that boat runs as good as it did day one when it was brand new. 
Yeah, um, it's great. Um, and uh, it, it's got plenty of time left on the uh, on on its lifespan of the motor. You have to do a few maintenance things, and there's some stuff that'll that'll wear out over time. But you replace those little items, and it'll it will keep running almost indefinitely. And that that brings me to something that just made me think about something is like the the age of the unit and what it influences in the whole financial situation. Mm -hmm. Typically, um, when you're dealing with a national lending, like a prime lender, is what we'll start calling them. That's what we refer to them as. There are prime lenders. They're the ones that they're they're looking for people and this is this is pretty standard for tow boats all over the place is they're looking for people that have 700 plus credit um that's pretty standard some lenders will go down to like 650 but that's pretty rare um most of the time they're looking for used anyway they're going to be looking for probably at least five percent down um and that depends on the boat's value, and we can go more into that later in, in how banks value boats. And you can use that when dealing with your dealers and everything like that, and you can educate yourself with, with values. Um, but the, the age of the unit does influence quite a bit in, in the finance. Typically after five years, you'll start to see a rate increase on the boat, and after 10 years, you'll see another one. Um, some lenders, it's seven and 14 years. It just depends on the lender. But basically, after a certain age, every lender is going to increase your rate uh, at least slightly. And then there will be another rate increase as the boat gets older. And that will typically be a cutoff year for them. Um, like anything after that year will be a no for them. Like most of my lenders right now, we're shooting this in 2023. Most of my lenders will do a 2011 the oldest right now some of them will go to like a 2010 um getting a loan um on something that's older than like a 2008 2009 something like that is getting increasingly more interesting um and a lot of that i think has to do with just banks don't understand how to value something that's that old and they aren't quite sure how to deal with it in liquidation should it go into default um and there's no guarantee of condition on something that's that that old for them they don't want to have to go out and inspect every single boat they don't have want to send out an inspector and they don't want to deal with the dealer doing the inspection because there's a conflict of interest and everything so the the, the best people to go through for that type of thing is a local credit union because they are comfortable that the boat's there it's in your area whatever state you're in it's a local institution. They'll take it to a local auction. They know exactly what to do with it. So they're the ones that will be kind of your best bet for things that are older than like a 2008, 2009. Well, and a lot of times that you get, it's similar to a lot of local credit unions. They, they when they do that, they, they still have the boat as a collateral. But I, I my assumption would be is that, that a lot of times they view those more like an unsecured loan, sure, than than the way that let's say a a large national bank would view a new boat. Um, and the main reason for that is because, you know, the value on, let's say, a 2008, um, an example of a boat we, that I, I've, I've, uh, I've seen bought and sold for a very long time since brand new 15 years ago, um, would be like a 2008 Centurion Enzo SV240. That boat has been worth roughly $50,000 for the last 10 years. Yeah, for uh, it, it just has not changed. It's just been about 50. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was worth about that in 2008. <laughs> um, and, uh, but what ends up happening is that there's, there are ones that are worth $50,000 and there's ones that are worth $25,000. Oh, like sure. The, and it's totally dependent on condition and how well it's been maintained and things of that nature. Cause when you start getting to a boat that's 15 years old, you can have ones that show up, like we have ones that show up that people are looking to trade that look brand new. And I mean, they look like as good as they did when they bought it new. Yeah. Right? They've replaced the interior in a lot of them or they've just. They just baby made, it, made, have kept it and keep it in a garage, treat it with yeah. uh, with a conditioner to make it so that it doesn't get UV damages, all kinds of stuff like that. Then we have some that come in that like, I mean, I'll take it a step further. We have four year old boats that come in that look like they're four year old boats, and we have thirty year old boats that come in that look like they're six months old. Sure. And so um, the condition factors in a ton, and but it gets a lot harder for a bank to value a boat. Um, based on condition profiles and things of that nature when it starts getting older than um, particularly 15 years. But once it starts getting older than 10, it becomes a harder thing to do. Sure. Um, 
where local credit unions or things like that will probably will be more likely to take some risk, but they view it to some degree like an unsecured loan and they're more they're more likely to do those as well as they're not really large amounts. Like most of the time guys aren't buying 2008, uh, at least towboats um, and, you know, spending $250,000 sure. um, and, and doing that, that would be, um, it would have to be some sort of really bizarre collector item. And even then that doesn't really exist in our world. So um, to that point, uh, this is something that I know changes on a regular basis. Um, it, it talk to us about le lender options. Cause I know that's something that a lot of people have questions about. You mentioned credit unions, I uh, mentioned national banks talking about getting them through, getting it through a dealer, not through a dealer, private party. What are the, what does that look like and what can people expect with those different options? So typically, um, if possible, I always recommend that people finance with a dealership, um, at least dealerships that have a good F and I department. I, and I know that's easy to say and hard to hard to know as a consumer if they have a good F and I department. But you, the questions to ask, uh, uh, just to stop that for a moment, like, well, McKay says good F and I department. I, I would typically that typically means if you've got a dealership that it's you know three people working, chances are they don't have a good F and I department. Sure. Um, if they're a, a larger dealer that sees a large number of units, large number of deals, they have a good, robust F and I department. And I, I would describe a good F and I department as guys that a know what they're doing, but that also, uh, they're selling enough units. That they have relationships with enough financial institutions that they have the ability to get you stuff better. Right. Um, they, they have access to things that other F and I departments may not have access to. Get. So, yeah. So as part of that is that, um, a lot of our lenders, they have, um, minimums. Like we, we, we can't have lenders that most lenders won't let you sit there under, you know, a contract with them and do $0 in loans for an entire season. So with that in mind, you have to work with enough banks, um, in order to and do enough units in order to work with many lenders. Um, because if you're only doing five boats a year or 10 boats a year or something like that, then you're only going to be working with maybe a couple of lenders. Um, we work with closer to at this point, 15 or 20 lenders than we do to five. <laughs> um, and a big part of that is that we just, we do enough volume, which is what you mentioned. Um, the other thing about that is, yeah, the amount of staffing that they have is is a pretty good indicator. If they have a full time F and I manager, um, that's a pretty good indication that they do pretty good business with with different institutions. Um, if it's just the sales staff that are taking your credit applications and just sending them out to banks and everything, they probably don't have somebody that actually understands why your customer would benefit from financing with a dealership they just are trying to finalize the deal and their customer needs financing where when you have a full-time F&I manager that kind of understands the business and understands the relationships with the banks and the customers and everything like that they're incentivized to get you the best rates to get you the best deal possible to find you the right cash down amount that works for you and and do those kinds of things um so with that, what um, we where you say we work with like 15, 20 different lenders, well, why do we do that versus have sure versus having let's say two? So um, and this is going to get fairly complicated. So if I get too in the weeds, then please stop me and I'll try to rephrase. So part of it is valuation of boats. So lenders can value boats in completely different ways. Some lenders will value off of like a base NADA trade value. Um, some of them will value trade plus options. Some of them will do it at retail NADA value. Some of them will use a value called a buck value, which is a marine specific valuation service that a couple of our lenders use. And those are more accurate, for instance, if I'm selling to a guy back east. Those are going to be more accurate numbers, and I'll try to work with a lender that uses those values because they're more in line and they actually value East, Central, and Western United States. Buck, Buck does. So unlike NADA, it's just the national values of, of the boats. Um, and, and setting yourself up with those lenders. The other reason um, is for uh, credit 
profile analysis. So what go through and look where somebody's pulling the strongest. Um, for instance, some people you'll see like an 80 point credit score swing between like Equifax and TransUnion. And so if you don't have a lender that's going to look at their TransUnion profile, then they're not going to get as good of a rate because rates are almost exclusively based off of credit score. There's a very, there's some other factors like loan to value ratio and stuff like that, but they're mainly based off of your credit score. So having a bunch of different lenders that you can submit to. And the other reason that we have a bunch of different lenders is competition. Um, if they see that you're submitting to other lenders that are in that prime category, their underwriters are going to be incentivized to give you the best that they can offer. Um, and so that's a few reasons. Um, and there, there's a few others that are more complicated that don't really affect the consumer, but mainly... Um, it's just options. It's the best way to, to think of it. If you have somebody that it's like, would you rather have 10 different options or would you rather have, Hey, this is the one thing that I can get for you. And so that's why we work with a bunch of lenders. And that's why, um, I, I always suggest that people go with a dealership when possible for an older unit, you'll go to a credit union, your rate will be slightly worse. And, um, that will be typical. If you go to, for a new boat, your rate will be worse there too, because they just don't do your local credit union doesn't do enough marine volume for them to like really dig into it and place a ton of capital in that area. They're doing it just as like a service for their members. Like the they want you to be able to have your mortgage, your car loan, your RV loan, your boat loan all under one roof. And so that's more why they offer that service than anything else, I think. Well, this is an interesting part is that oftentimes we'll see different banks that um, they, they get to where they specialize in specific things. Sure. So if, if like, at, and, and the really interesting part is it will change and shift over time. Like, um, at, at I know one certain period of time we were running, I would say 75% of our loans for boats that were over $100,000 through U.S. Bank. Sure. And then it shifted over to where we were using a, a different lender, like a Truist Financial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or something along those lines. There's different banks that will specialize based on how much you're wanting to put down, exactly. what, what, how much um, debt to income ratio you have, what kind of, um, what the valuation of the unit is, um, what uh, credit score you have. There's just a lot of variance and they will shift and move. And the really interesting and great part about having access to a lot of lenders is we can make sure that you get the best rate and the best term from any one of these lenders that we have that we'd have access to. And a lot of it is timing. I'm, I'm glad that you, you you said that because that's something that I forgot to, to mention is timing. Like there will be one week that every single loan for that whole week will write will be one lender and then they'll have a rate shift. And then the next week, every single loan we write will be from a, from a different lender. And it's like, and it just, it entirely depends on what their rates change to. If one lender bumps their rate up before another lender, suddenly we're using that other lender until they see the rate increase. And then we just move down the chain until suddenly all of our lenders have seen the rate increase. But now we just go back to the beginning and keep cycling week over week and just try to find people the best that we can find. Which uh, this leads into another piece that is that it's in many cases we... Um, it's something that the differences that we see between the different financial institutions oftentimes are dramatic. Like it, it's, it, you can see a shift that your payment goes up $200 a month with one lender and it's all additional interest. There's no, there's no value in the additional um, rate hike. And it's just because of the way that the underwriters are processing and looking at that loan. Um, and, and, you know, we, to go to a layer that's a lot more complicated, it actually has to do with the business structure of the bank. And so a lot of people don't think of banks as businesses, but that's what they are. And um, Bo, Bo Loans is one of their investment portfolio arms. And so you'll have different banks that will want to diversify their investment structure based on what, um, based on different asset classes. And they'll look at marine lending as one of those. And the, just depending on how they're shifting and managing their capital um, asset classes, they'll adjust the rates accordingly. And so that's where you see banks that have radically different rates. And this is not just day in and day out. This is like 
or this is week to week, you see big shifts between sure. different banks. Um, and we've seen guys as much as a two percentage point difference. And and it's almost like you can tell, it's not almost like you can tell, it's like they don't want to be underwriting marine loans at that time. Like they'll shift their rates up and then a month later they'll pull them back down. Mm -hmm. And something in their model said that they didn't want to put capital into marine at that time, I, whatever their position was. And then, yeah, so it, it really is. And so, yeah, if you're, a, if you're a boat dealership that only works with three lenders and those three lenders happen to be on the fritz that week, then, then you can put your, your clients into a pretty uh, hairy situation. Um, and so, yeah, something, something to look at uh, for sure is ask your dealers, how many, how many lenders do you guys work with? Like, what's your, what's your F&I process, you know? And, and, and don't be afraid to ask, your F and I manager, you know, what, what, are, what rates are you see? Like, I, it's so weird. People get so, they, they get kind of nervous when they start talking about this kind of stuff with me a lot of the time when, you know, it, they're like, oh, you know, rates are, rates aren't what they used to be. And they, they get kind of skittish and that kind of stuff. But just, just ask, you know, I, 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 I was talking to a guy last week and, you know, you, we were kind of looking and we weren't able to get him exactly the rate that he wanted. He decided to pull the trigger anyway, because we started just getting down to the numbers of it and it ended up that it was really costing him an extra 35 bucks a month in interest. And it was like, I think it was three quarters of a percent for his loan. And it wasn't a huge loan. It wasn't like a $200,000 loan or anything like that, but it really was only impacting his actual payment to interest by like 35 bucks a month. And after really getting into the numbers and sitting down and, you know, me being able to answer his questions uh, in the right way, we decided together that, yeah, that 35 bucks a month for him to take that boat was a no brainer for him. And yeah, you just need somebody that you need an F&I manager that you can talk to and are, are comfortable asking these questions to, you know, how much is that, you know, that's half a percentage higher than I thought it would be. What What's that actually doing for my payment? Like, why? If they can't tell you why, that's a big problem. If they can't tell you why it was 0.5% higher than what, what they were expecting or, you know, it, be able to ask the questions. Just be comfortable. Absolutely. And and that's, kind of, that's really the interesting thing. I mean, sometimes the feedback that we'll get back from banks is kind of convoluted and we almost have to have to uh, have a have a disagreement and have a discussion with the uh, bank underwriters. Um, but that's the thing is having guys that will go to bat and, and try and get that arranged for you is, is key because it can end up making a big difference and can shift your, shift your payment in a dramatic way. Or there might be aspects depending on what it is and depending on what the changes are, it might change your payment by 35 bucks a month. And sure. um, sometimes guys will, will look at it and I know that we see this on, on uh, the side of things. Um, on the sales end of the spectrum, my sales guys uh, run into this on a regular basis that they'll have somebody that's looking at like a, um, a later model used boat. And then they'll look at what a new one costs. And once again, back to the perception thing, they're viewing it the same way that they do cars and they're going, Oh man, you know, I could buy this used one or I could buy that new one, but it's going to be 40% more. And oftentimes when they actually look at the numbers, because financing rates are typically better on new boats than they are in used. Um, when they started looking at the numbers, they're like, wait, for forty dollars a month, I can get a, I can go from this to that, and and a lot of that is cash what? flow. Yeah, it, like we we deal with this all the time. It, Supreme is a big one for us with this, where guys will be looking at a, like a five or seven year old, really high end boat, like a like a a G twenty five or a RI two fifty seven or a, you know an M series from out like these five year old boats in that category, and they look at like a new Supreme or something like that. And they're like, Oh, well that's 10,000 bucks more or something like that. But really they're not looking at the benefits that you're going to get, which is all of the full warranty thing, you know, all of the upgraded features, that kind of stuff. But mainly for, if you're going to finance that transaction, it's a little bit different if you're paying cash to look at it this way, but if you're going to finance this transaction, just from a cash flow situation, if you're going to finance, and it's easy for me to say this, because I, I, I understand I'm, I'm the kind of guy that I don't like to finance things if, if, I, if I don't have to. That's the way that I live my life. But if you are going to finance something like a boat, that extra 30 bucks a month might, 30, 40 bucks a month might give you features that, 
you will definitely be happy with down the line instead of looking at something that you perceive as a better value because it's slightly less expensive, but your actual cash from a cash flow perspective and from a features perspective, it might be worth looking at moving to something that is brand new and something like a Supreme that has a ton of features that those 2016, 2017, 2018 high end like high class boats do they have basically the same features in most cases now um and so yeah just something to consider that, that we look at all the time well if you talk about that like let's say somebody's looking at like a new or looking at like a used uh Nauti g series or a, a centurion ri or something like that um oftentimes not, not only can they get a new supreme um and have their payment be in many cases lower Right. Um, they can actually sometimes get like a new Centurion FI, which the the interesting thing about that is you take a look at like, like let's just say a 20, you go to a 2017, 2018 Centurion RI, um, a new 2023 FI, I mean, it's a, it's a nicer boat than a 2017 for sure. It's in virtually every way. There, there's really no, no place that you're down, that you're downgrading. Um, in fact, it's an upgrade in, in a lot of aspects. And so, um, when you look at that and you're going, hey, the new one is maybe slightly more expensive, but when you look at the interest rate difference, your payments are within, were, can oftentimes be very, very close. Sure. And that's something that um, a lot of times people aren't really used to um, when they're when they're looking at that because that's not necessarily the case with, uh, with, with other things that people are familiar with. And that's the thing. From a cash flow perspective, if you even look at it from, even if it's 100 bucks a month difference, 1200 bucks a month for your overall experience into a new boat with your peace of mind with warranty and that kind of stuff is definitely something to consider. Mm -hmm. I mean, an extra 1200 bucks a year for me would be to get full warranty and everything like that is the no brainer. So, um, that's really the benefit. I think that most of our clients, uh, see that in at least the really high end models, uh, as well is that, yeah, it, it's, Getting that that benefit of financing with cash flow for a lot of guys, whether you're in a Supreme or whether you're in a really high end boat, it, we see a lot of guys finance just because, yeah, it's just nice not to sink all that cash into <laughs> into um, and spread it out over the year because you're going to recycle your boat over, lose maybe a couple thousand bucks in the process. And which to line in that, there's a few other pieces I think are helpful for people to know, and that is typically with the the financing options we do with with very limited exceptions. There's not like early payoff penalties. There's not they they can pay it down. They can pay it off. Um, with it, I mean, they can pay it off in a year, and it it's not a problem, right? Um, if uh, if you'd like to, from a cash management standpoint, tying that in, one thing I wanted to hit on is that um, oftentimes people are kind of worried with a lot of different things, such as whether it be early payout penalties or additional fees or things. So talk to us um, to kind of wrap this up, what the different loan structures are, what we typically do, um, what, or what the lenders will we work with typically do. Um, and as well as uh, last thing to kind of wrap this up is uh, talking about a few of the other different, um, what I refer to as uh, back end products or different things like gap insurance and things like that that you may, that people may see from different dealerships are those different things worth it are they not worth it what do, what, what do we what do you recommend or what do you think on that? sure um so some of the concerns that we get a lot the main questions that we get when we're actually contracting is yeah prepayment penalties um any lenders that we work with there's either zero or it is extremely minimal um for the reason that we just went through if you're going to do penalties after when after five years to pay off your boat and everything that's not going to work for most people. Um, so like U.S. Bank, for instance, they have a $300 payoff penalty. So no matter when you pay it off, if you pay it off early, it's 300 bucks. Where, you know, there are some lenders out there that it's a substantial amount. It can be up to 3% of the loan um, or 5% of the loan even in, in some cases. And we don't work with any lenders like that um, because it, it puts our clients in a terrible situation. Um, the other one is like uh, variable rate. We don't work with any lenders that offer any sort of variable rate structure. Um, we also don't work with any lenders currently. We used to back when um, a 20-year loan wasn't the norm, back when boats were close to the $100,000 average price tag than they are now. 
um, that do balloon payments, um, which is like a structure where you're paying as though you're on a 20 year term, but after the first half of the loan, after 10 years, then the rest of the principal becomes due. So you're basically paying on interest exclusively not exclusively basically exclusively for the first 10 years and then you pay a, a large chunk to principal um and we used to do a lot of those um like a decade ago basically um but now we don't work with any lenders that, that do those kind of thing which and the banks will do that balloon payment essentially as a way to allow, allow them to reset the rate after 10 years right um it gives them a little bit less exposure which if you're doing a boat loan um, currently, um, yeah, the problem is, is that 10 years out is a long window to try and anticipate what interest rates are. Um, and so right now our interest rates are about an average position when it comes to boat loans, at least if you look over the last like 30 years historically, right. um, it, it's, and for the whole time that we've been in business, it's about average to where it is. Um, but we just came off of them being historic loans and it, uh, lows. And if you were to have a balloon payment that was set up back in 2021, um, and you, you had a boat loan that was down in the fours, as an example, um, which is the lowest that we had ever seen. Um, it, it, that would potentially reset to a higher rate or like it's it's a high likelihood it would reset to a higher rate because you're not typically going to have that kind of a rate environment. Exactly. You know, on a permanent basis. So. And so so those are some of the concerns that um, that, that we get um, when contracting. And, and generally, I would avoid getting wrapped into any of those scenarios. Um, if you have a dealer or a local credit union or something that you're working with that has any of those things, even if you're pretty set that I'm going to keep this boat for a long time, I don't, I don't mind, you know, with the, the prepayment penalty and everything like that. The amount of people that say that and then four years later, something really, really cool comes out or something like that and they just have to have it no matter what. Um, that, that happens quite often. So yeah, which, I, I would just avoid getting wrapped up in that scenario at all costs. Which that brings up an interesting point. Um, cause I said the average lifespan that people keep a boat is four years, um, which is accurate. We see people from time to time that they just turn around and sell their boat cause life situations change or something like their, their kids get older and, and move out and, and, uh, they, their lifestyle shifts a bit. Um, but one of the biggest misconceptions out there is is an, an age old adage that a lot of people um, have probably heard, which is the two best days of your life, uh, the to two best days you own a boat are the day you buy it and the day you sell it. Um, that may have been the case a long time back in the day. Um, I'm going to say the vast majority of the time that people are selling their boat and like let's say exiting a loan early is because they're upgrading. Right. Um, it, it's it, that one's a one of the probably. Probably my favorite thing that I see in, or one of the favorite things that I see in, in running and operating a dealership is seeing people come in and they're buying a 10 or 15 year old boat that's, that's low, uh, low uh, towards the lower end. I mean, at the point, it's not, you know, it's not a beater by any means. I mean, it's still a twenty five, thirty thousand dollars dollars boat or, or sure. 40 or $50,000 boat. Um, and they're going through and writing and signing the loan paperwork and they're kind of nervous and they're going, man, are we really buying a boat? I don't know if this is a good move or whatever. And two or three years later, they're they're there in uh, they're there in in our offices doing doing paperwork. They're sit back, relax, happy as can be. They're buying a two hundred thousand dollar boat, and they're signing. The, they they can't wait to get that paperwork signed and get done. And it, don't even look through the contract. Or anything it, like it, that. It's just... amazing because they, they, there's no trepidation at all because the, the what we hear from people over and over again is they're like, look, this is what we do, like. Yeah. Like we got a boat, not sure if we do use it. We're on the lake three, four days a week. Yeah. Um, and we're like, this is what we do together as a family. And we wouldn't trade our boat for anything. And it's our, it's our favorite thing. It's our most prized possession that we have. And uh, that's a way more common scenario than guys that are getting rid of their boat because they're going, oh man, this thing's a money pit. Oh, like single digits in the last decade that I've been doing this. Yeah. That, Single digit. That was the really interesting thing that happened with COVID is uh, people were uh, back in 2020, uh, we were talking to people in the summer, like, oh man, it's going to be a free for all. We're going to have clearance boats like crazy in 2021 because everyone's going to sell these boats because they're going to realize they got in too deep and it was a, it was a mistake and to get out of them. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. The exact opposite happened. Yeah. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> what happened is all those people that bought boats in 2020 that had not owned boats before, they're gone. Oh, this is really fun. <laughs> this is yeah. great. Well, and they turned around and bought. Busier than ever. And then they were upgrading their boat in 2021. And so the used market didn't just go down in 2021. It went up further, um, which was really kind of bizarre. Now that supply chain's normalized and that, it's, it shifted, but it still hasn't gone way down just because um, cause demand is still still pretty high. And so, um, so uh, but last thing, talk, talk to us about some, some of the different things like um, like gap insurance and warranties That's and right. that type of thing. Are those things worth looking at? Are they things that you'd probably recommend avoiding to people and, and why? You know, I, I was just telling uh, one of our sales guys, Tanner, uh, yesterday when he, he just closed on a, on a 2017 RI-237. And they were asking about all of that exact thing, extended warranty, because the boat's just fresh out of warranty right now. Um, and that kind of stuff. And generally speaking, um, and, and, and this is just me and you can feel free to pitch in your two cents on this side with, with the extended warranty thing. I definitely think it depends on the age of the unit to where I think it's worth it versus worth it versus not. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if a boat is fresh out of warranty, one of the things to consider is that, um, a boat that's fresh out of warranty will probably already have had most of the warranty items that will go wrong handled. Um, and so I generally think outside of that scenario, you know, if it's fresh out of warranty, I would definitely uh, look at kind of how it's been serviced and that kind of thing. Um, because generally speaking, you're not going to run into those expensive warranty items like electronics, engine issues, that kind of stuff. After, yeah, four or five years, you might consider looking at something like that. Um, gap insurance, we don't even offer um, at our dealership, and I would be very wary of dealerships that do. Um, just because in, in our experience, um, in the entire time we've been in business, we've totaled single-digit boats in 30 years, and well, over 30 years now at this point. We've actually totaled single digit boats. So gap insurance, um, in my opinion, seems to be just extra money in your dealer's pocket. Um, we definitely feel like it's scamming people out of money, so we don't entertain it at all. Um, and like any of the credit life, any of that kind of stuff, we don't we don't offer any of that kind of stuff either. Now, some of the other back end products that we we do offer, we do offer extended warranties, but we make sure that it's with a reputable reputable company that is actually covering the expensive items that are going to be covered with your engine, with the electronics, with, you know, the maintenance items that are going to be the ones that are going to be the ones that you want covered, the very expensive ones. Um, and then we also look into things like, um, I think they're typically referred to as like environmental packages and that kind of stuff, like whether that is ceramic coating, clear bra, um, that kind of stuff. Some lenders will entertain those as back end, and you can add them into your loan. Some lenders don't. They only will do like proratable items, like extended warranties as back end. Uh, things that are cancelable, for instance, is what a lot of lenders will use as their back end products. Um, but some lenders will let you do additions, like tire, you know, any wheel and tire type of maintenance packages, um, that kind of stuff. So. Um, those things are definitely worth it, depending on what you're looking to do. Ceramic coating is one of our favorites. Um, we can wrap that in pretty often as back end. Um, but yeah, th th that's just kind of my my two cents about the the typical back end products that that dealerships offer. Um, I, I I would just be very wary of dealers that want to add on a few hundred dollars a month of extra back end products for you because the boats, um, if you're buying this style of tow boat, most of the items um, are going to be taken care of by the boats them themselves. Uh, they're, they're optioned out and stuff with things that aren't going to need back-end products to cover them. Absolutely. And, and I'll throw my two cents in on this. Um, echoing off of what McKay said, uh, first off, if we're talking about extended warranties, it, it's just a very clear thing is to understand what it is. It's basically you're paying for a extra insurance policy that, that's really what it comes down to um and uh what i would recommend 
is if it was a boat that I was not that familiar with or that the dealer was not that familiar sure. with, then I would have uh, I would have an extended warranty. If they if it's if it's a boat that they that the dealer sold brand new that they have all their service records on that they've maintained it and you can see those service records um there's a possibility just like with any insurance program you're there's a possibility that you're going to that uh that you could have something catastrophic happen like you could have an engine failure that takes place a year after the you buy the boat and it can have an issue um it's highly unlikely and so it, it depends on a lot of the same factors when you're looking at just that with any kind of insurance policy, if um, if uh, it would be a stretch for you, if you had, I mean, really the biggest thing that you could have happen that would be a warranty coverage issue would be if you had to do a full engine replacement or really probably a rebuild. I mean, having a full replacement is is almost never the case. You'd have to have some like sinking the boat to have that happen, and that would be an, an actual insurance claim. Um, but if let's say that you uh, threw an engine wrong, um, as an example, um, it's a very uncommon thing but you could have it happen. And if that's the case, you're probably into that, let's say $15,000. Um, if you have the ability to, where that's not gonna put you in a really big bind to have that kind of, that, that large of a bill that were to come across, um, then I probably wouldn't do the extended warranty packages just because you're paying extra, it, they're there for a reason. They, they, the extended warranty companies make money on them for a reason. Mathematically, you are, more likely to save money by not buying them. That being said, if it's a boat that, let's say, a deal, the dealer had traded into them, they'd never worked on prior to that point, um, and things of that nature, that's when having that extended warranty package, it, it would probably give me a little bit of peace of mind and, and sure. show there. So I'm kind of split between them. I would typically lean towards no extended warranty, but especially if you're the kind of person that likes having insurance, like having warranty that's built in, it's not a bad way to go. Um, I personally would not do an extended warranty on a new product. Um, the The five years is typically adequate. Um, this one is, it's not a complete ripoff. I mean, you can certainly get it. Um, it's just not typically worth what you pay for it. So I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. But once again, it's something that you could get and it's not a, it wouldn't be necessarily a complete waste of money, but it's, it's not something I would personally buy. Um, and if you got, once again, to what McKay said, if you've got a dealer that's really pushing you to do it or really pushing you to buy any of these products um, heavily, I just just realize that they're doing it because there's a financial incentive on their end. Um, on uh, echoing and going off of what McKay said on gap policy, um, most of the lenders that are out there, gap insurance is built into the loan already. And so if you're paying for additional gap insurance, you are just flat being charged more money. And there's you're, you're not getting anything for it. Um, there's some dealers, it's a major profit center. Um, it could be a major profit center for us, but I, we, we refuse to do that. Um, and uh, we, we want to make sure that people are paying for, that, that, that there's a value exchange in what they're paying for. So um, with a lot of the products we sell, they are expensive. They're, they're, they're high-end products. And um, you get, but you get what you pay for. And we feel like there's a good, strong value proposition behind them. Um, I'm not going to sell somebody something, whether it's, uh, whether it's an insurance product or, a, or a coverage piece or, uh, or a, um, honestly, even like a surfboard that's not good. Um, and there's no value exchange for it. Um, there was actually back, back in the day, there was a board that was manufactured, uh, by one of the brands that we carry, um, that if, if you do a lot of research, you probably able to figure out which one it was, um. But it just didn't really work properly, and we brought a whole bunch of them, and uh, we ended up throwing them all in the dumpster because um, we wouldn't. We just got to where we wouldn't sell them to people, um, and that was really expensive for us. We probably could have sold them, but uh, we want to make sure people have a good experience. So, um, and that, that they that they don't end up getting. Um, we we don't want to screw anybody. <laughs> um, that's that's kind of the key. And so, if if something feels off, and if uh, particularly if you're talking to a salesperson. At, from a dealership, or if you're talking to an F and I person, especially, and they feel icky and slimy, like when you're interacting with them, there's probably a reason for that. Because I can tell you that, uh, particularly, there's a lot of people that come in to our dealership. They're talking to a sales guy. They end up being, they end up talking to McKay in our F and I department. And sometimes there's a little trepidation going, "Oh, am I going to get strong arm? Is this going to be like an auto dealer experience where I'm walking into a finance arm and they're they're trying to." convince me to make me feel all uncomfortable that I got to buy a whole bunch of extra stuff and do things. 
Um, sometimes people are worried about that. And when you come out the other side, uh, McKay can actually attest to this is, um, it, it's almost a negative because he'll have, uh, with how we treat people and how we do things in our F and I department, because, uh, he'll have people who reach out to him and, and ask him service questions, <laughs> yeah. uh, they're both yeah. um, cause they had a great experience working with him and, and they trust what he had to say. And he's like, yeah, he, he, McKay will be the first one to tell you he's not a, he, he, he might be a financial technician, but he's not a Marine technician. Um, and no. so. Uh, lo loves being on the boats. Doesn't doesn't really know how to get in and wrench on them very well, um, and so that's the thing. Is if you're talking to a guy that's good at F and I, it should feel like you're talking to somebody who's an advocate who is there helping you and, and teaching you, and not somebody who's trying to uh, trying to sell you something. Um, and so that's something to just keep in mind. Is they is uh, most people when they go through that process with our company, they leave out the other side. Um, feeling a lot better about the transaction than they did going in. Um, and that's that's a very, um, that's an important piece, an important part for us and why we have a really high satisfaction rating coming out of our F&I department. So, um, and and uh, helps people out quite a bit. So, um, perfect. Well, McKay, anything else you want to add on the topic of finance that we haven't covered or talked about? I mean, we kind of went through probably more detail than most of the people that are listening or watching this have ever heard in regards to uh, boat financing before. No, I, I'm happy to answer any questions, by the way. Just go ahead and hit on our website on Boardco Boats. My information's right on there. Text me, whatever. If you have more in-depth, I can't imagine you do, but <laughs> you have anything more in-depth. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me in. Indeed. Thanks, guys. I hope this information has been helpful. Um, if you do have any questions regarding boat financing, whether it's a boat we have or if you just want feedback and input, um, we're happy to be be of service and we're happy to help. So reach out to us. We're, we're happy to answer any questions we ha that you have. Um, provide more information. If you want more information, go and put it, put it in comments. Um, subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, check out all the other different places that we do, um, as well as you if you'd like a whole lot of or any additional information or if you'd like to know what, what, like what kind of uh, financing that you would necessarily qualify for or something like that, you can reach out to us on boardco.com um, and we can go through and, and uh, with a couple of just simple questions, we can answer things for you. Um, that is something that we do on a regular basis, actually, is we can, we can semi-pre-qualify people with just them telling us some information. We can give them some pretty good ideas. Um, we don't necessarily have to run a full credit profile or anything of that nature. Um, one other last thing. I do want to mention there is a big misconception that exists out there um, that I didn't even think about until this is uh, talking about until this, this moment. Um, there's a big misconception that you by by the fact that we work with a bunch of different lenders and submit uh, applications to a lot of different lenders that it will negatively impact your credit. So anytime you have a credit poll, it will reduce your credit score um, as, as a result. But it's a one time thing. So in other words, we can submit a credit application to 15 different lenders and it's going to only ding your credit one time. So that is something to just keep in mind. Um, that's never a negative. Anybody that tries to convince you of that, it's probably just because they don't have access to enough lenders to give you options. Um, but you will have a, you will be dinged on a credit score, but if you're shopping for a boat or something like that, you can have your credit dinged 30 times in a in a one week time span and it's going to, it won't have any difference versus if you have a ding once. So, um, in fact, there's services that effectively just automatically do this, um, for us. And we, we use some of these different, uh, technological services to where we can get answers really quickly, um, and essentially get offers from banks, uh, that can come back and service you. So, um, so once again, thanks a lot for spending some time with us. We know this is in depth and in the details, but it's a questions I know a lot of you guys have. Um, and hopefully it's helpful information. So once again, this is Mitch and McKay from Board Co. Thanks for spending some time with us. We'll see you later.